Let's all welcome Dr. Ong, our next speaker. Thank you, Doug, for the fine introduction. And I'd like to thank Doug and Westhill for inviting me to this very uh, informative symposium. So what is AFib? The diagram here on the right side shows a normal activation of the heart, starting with the sinus node, going through the AV node, going to the ventricle. Uh, when you are in fibrillation, however, there are areas in the heart that become very uh, uh, chaotic. You can see all these wavelets going around, all these arrows going around in the atrium. And that's in fact what you feel like when you have atrial fibrillation. The heart goes really fast, very irregular, and it's very uncomfortable. Atrial fibrillation affects 2.2 million uh, patients in the United States. Symptoms are widely varying. Most patients complain of palpitation, but up to about 50% of patients have absolutely no awareness of their irregular heart. Does everybody need Coumadin or other forms of uh, blood thinner? Not always. There are several risk factors that are important when we consider patient uh, for, uh, for being on um, blood thinner. Heart failure. High blood pressure, those older than 75, diabetics, and those with a history of stroke or TIA. So we take all these points, we add them together, and we come to a, a formula called CHAT score. And the higher the number you have, the higher risk you have for stroke. Therefore, we recommend uh, anticoagulation or being on blood thinner. Now, there are many treatment options for atrial fibrillation. Some of you may recognize some of these drugs, and this is not what I'm gonna talk about today. You can shock the patient. How many of you have heard of cardioversion? Electrical cardioversion. You've seen it on TV, it's very dramatic. It works, but it doesn't, the effect doesn't last. You can put in a pacemaker, or you can do open heart surgery to actually fix fibrillation. But these treatment either are not very effective or very invasive. Uh, and then you have the option of catheter ablation. Ablation basically is a way to eliminate electrical problems in the heart. You put a catheter into the heart, and this is a, a computer-generated image of your atrium, which is where fibrillation comes from. And you can see a catheter right there in real time. So this is a picture taken from the procedure where the catheter is in the heart and we navigate the catheter to the place where uh, the uh, cells are very active and cause atrial fibrillation. So how do we access the uh, heart uh, from the groin? In, in our case, we have to go through the uh, groin to go through the femoral vein and then we navigate the catheter into the heart. So once we're in the heart, we focus on the cardiac structure, and specifically on the left atrium. In this picture, these are the ventricles, and the right atrium here, and the left atrium there, okay? And you can see catheters are placed in different part of the heart in order to make recording and to map to see where the fibrillation is coming from. If you look in the literature about atrial fibrillation, you'll come across the term pulmonary vein. Pulmonary veins are very important in the genesis of atrial fibrillation, and there are four of them. And in this picture, you can see the right superior pulmonary vein, left superior, left inferior, and the right inferior is right behind the septum. In our ablation, what we aim to do is to eliminate all the electricity within and around the veins. So we basically use the ablation catheter and draw circles. Big circle on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, and big circle on the right. Now, in order to draw circle around the heart and do all these sequential burns, it's not easy. You can't see it on x-ray, so we require something called 3D mapping. And what 3D mapping is, is simply looking at a three-dimensional structure and have it represented in a computer so we can navigate it, a uh, catheter in it. It's very similar to you driving in your car with GPS. These days, everybody drives with a GPS, right? Remember the days we had to ask for direction? How do we get there? Yes, you go right, go left, turn left, see the stop sign. 
you know? By the time you make a first turn, you forget where you were going, right? <laughs> These days, you don't need that. You get your GPS, and it tells you where it is, and you know where you are at all time, and that's what's important, right? We like to know, at any point in time, where the catheter is in the heart. So this is an x-ray picture of the, of the vein. This is one of the veins, one of four veins you have in your atrium. And on a fluoroscopic picture, or on an x-ray, you just see a two-dimensional picture. Now, when we take that picture and expand it to a three-dimensional picture, then you get what we call 3D mapping. And the nice thing is you know where your catheter is, you know the right atrium, the left atrium, and you know all your reference points, and you can, in the procedure, you can actually rotate the map in real time. And you know the back of the heart, the front of the heart, and you have absolute certainty of where you are. And that's very important because we're drawing dots. We're making dots around the vein in a very specific fashion. If you're off to one side, you're going to the ventricle. If you're off to the other side, you go to the back of the heart. So you have to be very careful. I'd like to show three examples of the patient that I've had over the years. This is a very interesting young man. He's only 42. He has atrial fibrillation for about 10 years. Most atrial fibrillation patients are older patients, but there are young patients as young as 19 years old that has atrial fibrillation. <coughs> and this patient has had it for a while, three to five episodes a year. And for that, I get about 20 phone calls. <laughs> We have tried many medications in the past, including sotalol, flagonite, and propafenol. How many of you have taken medication for atrial fibrillation and found it to be absolutely effective? One, okay. So it does work sometimes, uh, but uh, the, the effectiveness is about 50 centimeters. So in this particular patient, because we failed three, three medications, there's really no alternative medical therapy, so we go do with the ablation. And here is a picture of the actual procedure itself. You can see um, on the right side we have the CT scan of the atrium. Remember the four veins I was talking about? Now you're looking at the back of the heart and the four veins are draining into the left atrium. On the right side is the actual map that we create. So unfortunately for us, we cannot go to the car dealer and just have a GPS installed in our system. We have to create our own map. So the map is created real time in the procedure, and then we match it to the CD scan, and then we start doing the ablation around the veins. That's left superior pulmonary vein, right superior pulmonary vein, left inferior, and right inferior pulmonary vein. So during the procedure, the patient went into fibrillation. You can see the electrogram showing very rapid activation. Just as we start doing ablation around this area, fibrillation terminated. So we know that we hit the fibrillation right on the spot. Now fibrillation is not just coming from one spot, but there are multiple spots and there are four veins. So it takes generally about two hours to complete a procedure like this. Now here's another patient with quite a different uh, heart history. He's an older gentleman with heart failure and has a defibrillator. Everybody knows what a defibrillator is? kind of like a pacemaker, but it's used for patients with heart failure. Okay. He's had atrial fibrillation for five years and uh, has almost daily recurrence, and he's very symptomatic. His heart rate typically goes to 150 beats per minute despite <coughs> multiple medications. So we took him to the procedure, and we did what we did for the other patient. Here's a CD scan, and here's the uh, computer rendering of the left atrium and we basically did ablation uh, around the veins. This is a pre-ablation picture. All this color you see represents electrical signal. We can see the electrical signals into the veins. Now once we've done the ablation, the veins became quiet, and that is designated by the uh, gray color. Okay, so that's a right superior pulmonary vein. There was a lot of electrical activity there, and after ablation, it became quiet. And once it's quiet, we know that it eliminated the uh, uh, arrhythmogenic uh, sources of the fibrillation. Same thing with the right inferior vein, left superior vein, and left inferior vein. Now, how do we know that fibrillation actually was eliminated? It's nice 
if the patient's saying, well, I don't have any more palpitation. Uh, but it's nice to have an objective way to assess whether the procedure was effective. Well, this patient happened to have a defibrillator, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And on this particular defibrillator, it can track how much atrial fibrillation someone has. So this is a longitudinal uh, uh, record of a patient over a year's time from uh, December 06 to December 07. On the vertical axis is number of hours of atrial fibrillation this patient had. And as you can see, he was having a lot of fibrillation, sometimes up to five hours a day. We did the ablation right here, and after that, pretty much clear. So not only does the patient feel better, even the doctor feels better. <laughs> we know we've done something. Now the last case I'd like to discuss is a little different form of atrial fibrillation called persistent atrial fibrillation. <coughs> the previous two patients have what we call paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, meaning fibrillation comes and goes. The episode is self-limiting, but that doesn't mean the patient don't feel any better, or it doesn't mean they feel any better because when you go into fibrillation, the symptoms are the same as in persistent. And this patient is an attorney, and Dr. Janali and I you know how much we appreciate seeing an attorney <laughs> in medicine. Uh, we, anyway, this patient has persistent atrial fibrillation and is on Coumadin, and he doesn't follow up to check his INR. He comes and goes. He doesn't know how much he takes. Yes, that blue pill. No, that pink pill. You know, I take half of it maybe, and his INR is either five or one. So it's it's a nightmare to take care of his anticoagulation. We eventually got his coumadin stabilized and we brought him to the procedure and for this patient, more than anybody else, they really need to be in normal rhythm. In this fan, you can see the red zone uh, around here, red and, and orange, showing where the origin of the uh, arrhythmia is. And on the back of the heart, you can see it progressing down the back side. On the front of the heart, you can see it going anteriorly. So it's coming from a very specific focus. And when we put the ablation catheter right there, the fibrillation had to be there for many years, stopped. And he's back to normal rhythm. So in conclusion, atrial fibrillation, uh, ablation is a procedure that we do it a lot these days. Success rate, depending on patient, can be as high as 90%. And it is a minimally invasive procedure. It requires putting catheter through the skin. It's not an open heart surgery. But it's an extensive surgery. It takes about two to three hours, sometimes longer. And it requires 3D mapping. And typically, it's a one-day stay. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Once you have the surgery, are you basically then able to immediately stop blood thinners or is it over a period of time? How does that work? So those are the questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, very important question. Uh, being on blood thinner prevents stroke. And it's very important to continue the medication around the time of the procedure and even after the procedure. Because patients with atrial fibrillation, when they go back to normal rhythm, the heart does not regain normal contractility immediately. It does take some time for recovery. And during that time, one is still susceptible to blood clot. So typically, in my practice, I recommend stay on Coumadin for three months after the procedure. And then you can stop after that. Now, whether we stop Coumadin in the patient depends on those risk factors that I showed in one of the slides. The more risk factors one have, the more likely this person may have stroke in the future. So even if you get rid of fibrillation, not everybody comes off an anticoagulation. Do you eliminate the K foods? Or do you oh, potassium, uh, I mean, uh, green, vitamin green, K. Green vegetables? Right, right. Vitamin K, you should avoid vitamin K, the green vegetables, when you're taking Coumadin. Uh, after the ablation, if you're going to stop the Coumadin, then of course you have no restriction on your diet thereafter. Let's take one more question. Mm -hmm. and then we'll, uh, the doctor will be here to answer questions. Yes, ma'am. A, the way we define atrial fibrillation is by the rate in the atrium. When the atrium is a fibrillation, it is very chaotic and extremely rapid. Sometimes the heart rate in the atrium can be as high as 400 beats per minute. 
each of tachycardia, we've uh, uh, described a particular tachycardia that is regular and uh, slower, as in 150 to 200 beats per minute. Different mechanisms, different areas of the heart. Let me just say with Dr. Ong, we had a patient today that said that Dr. Ong literally saved his life through an AFib procedure. So if we can save one heart, one life, we're, we're going down the right road. Let's give a big hand for Dr. Ong.